Okay, we're uh, just waiting for the just waiting for the military cross when it sort his fucking admin out. Whoa, whoa, whoa! <laughs> Tiger. <laughs> <laughs> part two, mate. Steve Heaney, MC, part two. Let's recap. So, how long have we got for the recap? Fucking hell! <laughs> <laughs> I say how lo- I say how long do you need, but we've been here now with time. <laughs> Yeah. Mate, I tell you what, buddy, first one was a good podcast. Really good. Really good, mate. But it needed that time. It needed yeah. that time, right? And yeah, it was nowhere okay. out of Russia. So, well, I did try in Russia, but it didn't fucking work anyway. Stubborn, yeah. stubborn northerner. Right, so, just like a brief recap, and you, I'm going to say it. <laughs> I'll control it, mate. And then you just jump in wherever. Deploy to Sierra Leone, not Palace, or one power battle group in a short, rapid, in rapid fire amount of time. So if people listen to this, and you haven't heard part one, you need to go back, but two episodes before, listen to Steve Heaney MC part one to get a gist of where we're at. So, 2001, 2000, 2000, 2000 in Sierra Leone, you deploy one pirate um, between the airport and the embassy. Uh, you are, you have gone through the first series of battles on the ground in the jungle in the village called... Lungilol. Lungilol. Um, and one power have come in to provide a relief in place. Okay, you've now got proper scales of ammunition because you initially deployed with 40 rounds of man, right, and some other stuff. Uh, you now got proper scales of ammunition. You've dealt with hmm, Brian Bud VC, rest his soul. At the time, dealt with the uh, female casualty. Yeah. Uh, female civilian casualty got shot yeah. in the chest. Shot in the shoulder. Shot in the shoulder. Did she survive? Yeah, she did, yeah. Um, and the platoon has decided... Well, let's take it from there. One power have just come in. So one power got in about half eight in the morning. About 30 of them. So platoon, Just a reminder of how strong you were at the time. 26. 26, cool. Yeah. 26. Mm. So... Sorry, so I, sorry, this is the last time I interrupt, Steve. Sorry. Okay. In the midst of in the midst of in the midst of what's gone on, yep. the platoon commander's gone back and compassionate. Yeah. So you're down at platoon commander. Yep. Who's taking over? So we've got um on the ground was Grand Harris, who had just recently passed the Carder. He was the two IC. He'd come in and like I said, he'd been with the platoon a few months. <clears throat> um two par- ops warrant officer was uh an ex two para guy, Wags Wardle, Graham Wardle. Awesome. So he was the ops warrant officer on the ground. So there was me and him on the ground, and then back in Lungi was the CQMS, uh, X1 para guy, Eddie Newell. So he was man in the rear. He was man in the rear link. So he had himself and four scalies back in the airport. So they were doing our admin, and then they were manning our our radio link. Our link was twenty four. We had a twenty four hour listening watch on. Um, so there's twenty six of us in, on the ground in the jungle. Um, one para came in about half eight again about 30 um, so they had the um, so it wasn't the platoon commander that brought them in it was the company commander so company commander company sergeant major came in about 28 blokes they instantly took over our positions and um, and almost sort of basically followed exactly what we were doing so they they, went, they kind of took over our battle trenches um, and they were, they'd set up a little VCP on the road at the entrance to the village. And they were generally going about their business, um, as paratroopers do, zipping about all over, you know, getting a feel for the ground. And, and again, because we just didn't know what was going to happen next. It was one of those situations where the rebels could come back at any time. So, uh, so yeah, because they, yeah. So on on the those initial contacts yeah. that before, what was it determined that was like a was that like almost like a forward like a sort of recce element to use the term? We didn't, yeah, for them, it could have been know. a probe. I mean, the, the the thing is, but you know, prior, I mean, nobody had ever engaged the rebels. We didn't fully understand what they were going to do. Prior to that, they just steamrolled over everyone, including the UN. They had such numbers, we couldn't control who was coming in and out of the village. So the biggest scare was how many of them had actually infiltrated the village. Had they done any recce? Had they had any eyes on? Had they plotted our positions? Was that a probe to test us? We just didn't know. Um, so, you know, as you do, prepare for the best, expect the worst and all that. Um, that first night, we hoped that that was enough. You know, I mean, of course, we wanted them to come back in daylight because obviously then it 
the advantage switches to us then you know we're trained marksmen we're better shots more disciplined we've got ammunition now now then it's a case of you know it's very easy to to, to pick people off um so one para took over we kind of took a breath then you know get around the blocks we re redistributed one ammo we scrounged a little bit of ammo off the one para guys so they um so we're just rebombing blocks are just carrying out some admin while one para in effect took over the duties in the village it was at that point that we decided well you know if they're wounded if this animal is wounded if this animal is bleeding if its animal is undisciplined then there is a very strong chance that we could catch it here um, and, and and pretty much end the threat there and then so we took the decision to send out a fighting patrol from the village we would leave two guys in the village, which would be Grand Harris and, the, and, and, and our 216 guy, the radio op. And the 24, of, 24 would divide into two 12-man teams. I would take one, Wag Wardle would take the other one. And we would push out, initially we thought we'd push out to the to the maximum range of the clansmen's. All we had was three four nines. So oh, right, okay. That's all we had for inter-patrol radios. So, I mean, 1.5K, even that in the jungle, we mm. all know it comes a, a, a terrible <coughs> in the jungle. So we thought we'll push out maximum LOE, limit of exploitation, 1.5K. We'll see what we can find. It also doubled up as a bit of a clearance patrol, if anything, you know, what, cause, because of the vegetation and the folds in the ground and, 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 and the runs that were leading away is there could have been dead, there could have been wounded, there could have been anything there. So a bit of a confirmation, but also, you know, let's just go and give them a, 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 another thumping if we can. <clears throat> so cleared it with one power and we set off. Um, the village, as we said initially, was, was dissected. The main track that was running from the east of the country was from Port Loco. That was really... The, the, the hive of rebel activity that was where they were basing themselves out of and they were making that journey west along the main track you know and this track was sort of what 20 feet wide hard and packed sand that was it it was called the port loco road but that was it so that was kind of our handrail so i kind of pushed about 150 meters north of it and wag and his team pushed 150 meters south of this track and then we kind of moved patrolled across this sort of cleared area that we'd got cutting down the villages to cut down to open up the fields of fire and after about six seven hundred meters we entered the canopy um now it wasn't completely cleared scrub sh shrub and scrub but um you could basically see so at that point for the first five six hundred meters i could see the other team moving you know sort of 300 meters to my to my right hand side yeah, so we that was it. We got we pushed into the jungle. Um, like I said, we hit the edge of the edge of the tree line after about six hundred meters, and then we kind of pushed in a little bit more. And then you know, and then you sort of we there were, or we went at that point. Visibility was down to your usual jungle, sort of ten fifteen meters maximum. Um, quite thick, um, quite dark, as you can imagine, a solid canopy cover. So there wasn't a lot of light getting in. Um, and we decided to push, and, uh, and obviously they were just hand railing. We were hand railing the track, and they were, you know, the team off to the right were, were just hand railing. And, we, you know, we, we were keeping in comms over the 319, just basically keeping pace with each other. Um, it was at that point probably about probably about 1.2 cane, so we pushed into the canopy about another 600 metres. How long did that take you? Uh, I think we, it was the jungle. Um, I mean, it wasn't. It wasn't Belize tight, dirty jungle that you get. It was. It was probably somewhere between Belize and Brunei. And for everyone that's ever been in Brunei, Brunei's nice and open. Brunei's more of a forest, isn't it, than than that sort of primary and secondary jungle that you encounter in Central America. So it was some, you know, somewhere in between. Going was relatively okay. Um, visibility was probably ten to fifteen meters. Um. Hmm, yeah, so we probably took us about an hour, nice mm -hmm. and steady patrolling. And again, the, the idea was was to try and pick up blood trails. And after a, and 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 sort of after that, within that first six hundred meters, there was quite a lot of folds in the ground. Uh, we nicknamed one Fern Gully. 
believe it or not, as you do. Um, I like you, that on, on the old, uh, you know, on the old sort of, uh, on the old card, um, you know, from your trenches and that, because it was a major fold in the ground that led from the track. And we thought if anyone's going to get within <laughs> striking distance of us, they would come out of the jungle, drop into that fern gully and then use that covered approach to get within about 150 metres of the village. Um so again, so when we dropped into that fern gully, you could see all the mushed up ground footprints. Where they'd been. Where they'd been, yeah. Um, and then once we entered the canopy, then we kind of seen all the vegetation that had been crushed. And, um, you know, there was a lot of sign there, you know, a lot of sort of, um, you know, ground sign where they'd been walking through, a lot of stuff that had been broken. Did it seem like, um, when? because when you were in that, you know, that first night of battle, and you would have had a, in the morning and after, or during it, you would have had an idea of their enemy strength. When you were going, pushing at the jungle there, and you saw the ground sign, did uh, did did it did it look like there was more or less of what you thought, judging by the ground sign? If it, you know, was it? Had, had I mean, the, we, we it, it were best guess. We we were told two thousand. I don't think there was two thousand. I think there was probably more in the more in that sort of. Low hundreds, maybe, maybe a hundred, maybe hundred and fifty, two hundred. In that attack on the first night, yeah, I think Fucking there could have hell. been. There could have been. Mm. But again, the, the the thing that happened for us is that almost as immediately as the attack began, and and the GPMGs opened up, I think that weight of initial fire, I mean, two GPMGs <laughs> bearing down down that centre of the track, you know, with two skilled operators. You know, that sort of cone of fire that must have been going down that very narrow track and into them, into that sort of, into where the camber dropped away. I mean, instantly, obviously, that the, the initial rebels just, the, the, you know, they were they would have cacked themselves, away. mate. It's like yeah. when you were talking about yeah. running over the UN and yeah. running, no one never put up a fight with them. You think, mm. you think, the, as from, you know, from our experience, mm. you think when a, when a poor military unit, infantry unit gets attacked, um, their 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 wish they're, they're like they're in shock. Their return fire, the return of fire is just a couple of black and rounds, really ill coordinated. Mate, you know, mm. you come up against any unit of the British Army, you know, let, let alone the Paras. You engage that unit, the weight of fire you get back within a split second, may yeah. knock you flipping, well, knock your head off. <laughs> it's I, I, a complete and, shock to the yeah, system. I mean, not experienced and, it before. And, and, you know, I mean, I didn't serve in in, in Afghanistan, but but having read. You know, having read and, and talked to a lot of guys, the difference is, you know, where, where the difference is, is that, you know, as a trained marksman, as you know, understanding the marksmanship principles, as you know, you are you are sort of completely in control of the weapon system. You are disciplined. You are only firing at what you can hit. You're aiming off. You're assessing strike. You know, there's a lot of coordinated fire. I mean, that's the dis that's the difference. And in the process of stealing back momentum, winning the firefight. That's what we do well. And that's the difference, isn't it, between going up against people that are massed in numbers but don't have that discipline. Don't probably the weapons are in shit state. You know, how quickly are they dealing with stoppages, which is what happened to the first guy. He knelt or fired his weapon, got a stoppage, and he paid the price. You know, so the difference there then, no matter what you're facing numbers wise, it's it's it equals out very quickly with a, with, with the skill and the knowledge and the experience of of trained, highly disciplined soldiers across the British Army, isn't it? So, I think initially they got they got you know they were like, wow, this has never happened to us before. We're taking vol, you we're, we're taking a mass of accurate, sustained, rapid fire. That's basically taking out people to the left and right of me i don't i've lost my stomach for this i think they kind of went to ground because we we measured it as they came three times so there was within that sort of contact period there was their initial sort of probe that we dealt with and then almost a lull then more movement and, con and and another push. So almost, let's give it a second go from the flanks. Because we were very, very exposed on the flanks. That was the danger. We had about a five, six hundred metre frontage. Because at that point, we could see anybody moving to the flanks. So we had our two end patrols at the, at the limit of, of where we could control. So anybody 
moving to the sort of left of our left hand patrol and to the right of our right hand patrol, we would see them. So if there was the sort of, you know, that sort of, if they were trying to engulf us and move round, you know, and envelop us, if you like, we would have been able to see it. So them two patrols were right out on a limb. And then, you know, we've got the two central patrols covering, one covering the main suspected approach route and one covering the sort of only open area where they could mass. Mm. So when you've got that frontage and you've only got sort of 20 men, in sort of four teams that's a lot that's a huge footprint to cover mm. so again and, and and i think when they sort of massed in them trees when they must have done their initial recce's because let's not let's not kid ourselves although they're you know we call them rebels and all the rest of it you know they've you've got sierra leone army soldiers that have deserted you've got people that have you know may have some a modicum of understanding of tactics. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you treat everyone with the respect and deserves until they prove otherwise, isn't it? Um, yeah. So you're, uh, right, so you're, you're 600, 600 metres in. We were, yeah. So we're about 600, we broke, yeah, we started seeing all the sign and then it was, you know, and then where it was being trampled, then we started picking up the old blood trails and, and, and that. And that pretty much led us about a further 600 metres. So at the 1.2k now, we're 1.2k's in, about 600 metres into the canopy, 1.2k's from the village, we hit the first sign of the, of, of, of let's call it civilization, mud huts. Because <clears throat> prior to that, we hadn't pushed out that. Our clearance patrols had only been pushing out, you know, sort of to the edge of the, edge of the area, uh, <clears throat> to the edge of the canopy. Um, and again, Everything suggested to us that that's the way that they would come. So all of our focus was on that area to the front of the village where the track left the jungle and then was at about 500 metres into the village. On the radio then, to the opposite side, talking to Wag, and they did, they hit a village as well. So what we think it was, well, in fact, what it was, was five or six buildings on the sort of north of the track and then two larger buildings on the on the south of the track so almost as if another village area had been split by the track 600 meters into the canopy but i mean this wasn't like the village we were living in that you know this was like really really basic basic structures you know um with no sort of i mean the structures we were in you know were the, the the village that we're in had been taken time there was a track plan in the village you know there was there was an element of maneuverability in there and people had lived there for some time so this new one was a bit hastily constructed uh, no what? i think it's been no it'd been there it had obviously been there at some time oh. but it just wasn't to the level of the, the yeah. of, of lungi long i think it was just people that just you know you know decided to throw up a little bit of a structure to to offer some sort of protection um, for them against the elements um, typical sort of six six or seven huts on this side so I'm on the radio talking to Wag told him we, we'd found something he'd gone he'd found something so at that point we kind of said right well we'll go firm and in 15 minutes giving each other the sort of QBOs in 15 minutes to avoid a blue on blue we'll both push into the village at exactly the same time so I'll, you know any noise off to my sort of to my right I know who it is um, so with, that's what we've done on the radio, very quickly coordinated, 15 minutes, and then we'll push into the village at the same time, simultaneously. Um, so again, so we're sort of like laid now, just, you know, probably about 50 metres from these structures in the jungle. Um, these structures, there was a slight area cleared around it, central fire pit, um, smoke coming from the fire, so that, you know, the fire was relatively, relatively new. Um, so we just we just sort of from that point there just plotted how we were going to move into the village you know broke the guys down moved the two guns we had two jimpies put the two jimpies in moved them forward to provide a base of fire <clears throat> broke the guys down into four two-man assault teams a uh, bit of a command element with me uh, and that's what we were going to do so four assault teams two guys on the jimpie and me and a and, 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 a, and, a, and a runner stroke Pepper pot, pepper pot, pepper pot forward. Yeah, that's exactly what it was, mate. It was going to be two guys, a bit of uh, a bit of room combat, you know, two assault teams, um, 
So the salt teams one through four um, going in, bouncing between structures, you know, very fast. There was no sign of anybody. There was no noise at all. Um, to all intents and purposes, it looked abandoned, but we didn't know. We just didn't know what was inside. Experience over the sort of last 10 days had told us that, the, you know, Civ Pop was just hiding from everybody, you know. So we didn't know if there was civilians inside. We didn't know if there was wounded rebels inside. We didn't know if there was rebels still there inside, getting the head down. So it was a bit of a, it was a bit of a, you know, we didn't quite understand what was what we would be facing. Um, so, H hour, 15 minutes later, simultaneously, my four teams go in and the four teams in the southern area go in to clean their building. <clears throat> and it's very rapid, very quick. Guys, you know, kicking in kicking in the wooden door. You know, the, the, the rooms were no bigger than sort of, I don't know, two metres be two metres. Dark, dingy, no light. Um, very claustrophobic, you know, guys in there, straight in, door open, trying to get some light in there. Obviously, there's no torches. Trying to get some light in there. Um, make sure there's nothing in there, no threat, and then moving on to the next building. It's very quick, it's very fluid. Lots of communication, lots of screaming and shouting, as you can imagine. And, um, yeah, and as the guys were going through, this is when they were finding, so there was finding boxes and um, of and link, lots of seven six two link lying about. Not British, you know, sort of RPD link. A um, couple of AK forty seven magazines, couple of piles of of ammunition here and there. Um, <coughs> blood, blood, mate. Um, you know, pools of congealed blood. Um, so yeah, it was. I mean, it was evident that they'd obviously took a hit, pushed back into the jungle, tried to regroup, sort themselves out. Um, I don't suppose for one minute they have the loyalty that we have. So I think the people who were capable had obviously uh, 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 had gone and withdrawn and anybody wounded or or on the brink of death had, uh, were pretty, probably pretty much left to themselves. Um, no bodies are. No bodies. That whole thing, I reckon that we were no more than 15 minutes to clear that. 10 minutes, 15 minutes to get a real good idea of what we were looking at. Consolidated ourselves on that point. So we're now gone firm in, on, on that sort of northern group of, of, of huts. And it was the same on the south wagon and, 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 the, and the southern team had gone firm. Reported in pretty much the same as us. Lots of destruction, lots of sort of stuff lying about, bit of weaponry. A couple of AK-47s had been abandoned. Um... But not, but but nobody. Um, so, on the radio, we said, right, let's push on. I mean, we told the radio operator and and Grant back in the um, back in the in the village that we would push on about one point two k, one point five max. But at this point, you know, your adrenaline's pumping. You can imagine it. You know, we're like, right, it doesn't end here. Let's keep going. So we decided to push on another K. So we took on the decision to push on about another K. Yeah. <laughs> you know what you're like? Long way in the jungle, mate. It's a, it's a long, long way, way in the jungle. It's a long way in the jungle, yeah. I know. <laughs> but, you know, we were, you know, we were in control of the situation and, and you're in your element then, aren't you? You know, it's small team tactics. It's, it's disciplined. It's stealth movement. You know, it's eyes on stocks. It's everything that the LERP school and everything that the tracking courses and everything that we do. I mean, I'd been to the jungle about seven times by then on various training courses. So, you know, I'm like you and I suppose everybody else out there that love the jungle. And, and, and there's a feel about it, isn't there? And, and, and I think when you're confident in your abilities and the guys, it doesn't really matter who you're up against. And especially in the jungle, because it's a bit of a leveller. You know, the jungle is neutral and all those classic sayings. Um, yeah, so we pushed on. Um, same thing again. Lots of ground sign, blood spatter. Um, you know, the old drag mark where, where someone's dragged a foot, heel print. Um, but nothing. Nothing. No bodies. No real, ev I mean, evidence of movement in a direction of travel, but nothing to suggest that we were going to come across anyone. Um, 
obviously the great disappointment of everyone. Uh, yes, please, man. Um, yeah. Good tea in there. Okay. Okay. Just put it over the top. Okay, go on. Then. There you go, on, mate. Yeah. Um, cheers, streaky. Streaky. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we use him as a gopher. He goes for this, goes for that. You need to get Mac Vicker on DVD. <laughs> <laughs> anyway so we push in and that's it i mean i'm talking on the other side of the uh i'm talking on the other side of the to, to, to the team to our south um and that was it we hit we hit that loe we so we're now 2.5 k's in pointless pushing on any further to be perfectly honest i mean that, that might have just been a you know a, a bit too a bit too much but um so we agreed to to sort of pushed to the track so I kind of turned south and we headed to the track they headed north and we kind of just RV'd on the track um, either side of it myself and, uh, and and Wag we had a bit of a head to head discussed what we were going to do told each other what um, what we'd found and at this point it was decided that what we would do in effect now would, would just extend so if you imagine we're now looking back the track sort of the axis if you like 2.5 k's is the village we said, right, well, what we'll do now is we'll, let's just make this a 360. Let's just start kind of widen the search, swing round on the way back, just to make sure that... Um, check those flanks. Yeah, check the flanks. Just make sure there's nothing, no nasty surprises. Um, and let's just, you, you know, let's just make a, a job of clearing what we can. The good thing about it was, and you remember in the first podcast I told you, so that off to the sort of south of the village was this abandoned railway line. Um so Wag obviously said, well, what I'll do is I'll continue to push further south and see if I can hit that railway line. And then we'll 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 follow the railway line back in. And again, because that's a great mobility corridor, if anyone had used it and got off to the flank, then inevitably, with any sense, they're going to be moving quickly up and down that mode, up, up and down that, um, that railway line. So he did that. Um, I got my guys, briefed them back up, and we kind of then we kind of turned, faced the track, and then we start swinging back towards the village. Um, nice and steady, you know, kind again, about an hour and a half back, patrolling back through. Didn't really come across anything, to be perfectly honest. And um, you know, back in sight of the village, and 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 move back in. We had a, a, a code word with a, with the one pair of guys who were technically now man in stag that we were coming back in. Um, so we got back into the village. Wags, Wags's team had moved down the track, found a couple more AK-47. So that was another three, another three AK-47s, plus the ammunition that we'd got. So there's obviously a lot of dropping stuff gone on, you know, whether it was in the moment or... Did you take it back in with you? Did you? Yeah, well, yeah, we took all, it, yeah, everything yeah. went back in. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, everything went back in. Um, so we're now back in the village. That was probably... I'd say it was about half one, one, half one. Something like that. We'd been gone about two and a half hours, about two and a half hours. That's in total. good going, mate, for that distance. Yeah, yeah. It, it light scales, though, yeah, isn't yeah, it? You yeah, know yeah, what yeah. I mean? And, um, you know, you're picking your way through. Uh, and as I said, it isn't, it isn't Belize. It was kind of, you know, a little bit more manoeuvrability in there. You know what I mean? So to be honest, it, that, that was all right. That was probably normal patrol pace, I think. You know, um, yeah, you know, yeah. So it it was steady enough. Um, so we're back in the village. Uh, what was the next thing? I suppose the next thing was the CO coming in. So CO One Para came in, uh, got a message on the radio. So his he came in with his with the CO's group um, about two o'clock. So we hadn't been back in the village long. We'd been back about half an hour, an hour tops. Um, and yeah, and the CO's group came in. Um, the one para company commander went down to meet them. We had two LS's, if you imagine. So if you imagine now the frontage of the village where we where we beat, had all the engagements. To the rear of the village, so away from the likely threat, was where we were going to bring the QRF in. So that was about 250, 300 metres um, outside the village towards the airport so away from any threat 
Off to the flank and slightly behind the village was a large open sandy area and that was the resupply. So anything that was coming in resupply was going to get brought into that HLS. And that's where CO's group came in. First thing, obviously, we knew of it was the Chinook landed and then um, <coughs> he, he walked up through the village with the, uh, with the OC of the, 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 um, the one power platoon. Um, usual people in his group, plus, um, you know, the rest of the PF guys who had been in the airport. So they came out as well. So uh, at the time, the OC, so our, our sort of command of the platoon at that point had passed to Mark Jackson, Jacko's son, Prince of Darkness. Oh, Mike Jackson's son. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know. I didn't even know he was serving. Mark Jackson. Yeah, Mark had been one para, and then uh, sorry, he'd be, was Mark? Yeah, Mark was one para. He did two years as a as a two IC the PF. He'd then gone back to one para. Obviously, when I, when when we when the OC had gone had left country, he took over command, if you like, of the of of of, of the platoon, and he was managing it back from Lungi Lol, oh. uh, from Lungi Loy, the airport. So he came in with, with Eddie and, and the signaler guys. Um, CO walked around, got a lie of the land, got the brief off the OC, uh, you know, from a one power perspective and then came and talked to us. I mean, he was, he, he was bouncing, mate. I mean, let's put things in perspective here. Although he'd sent us, and it, it subsequently turns out when Brigadier Richards came in the next day, the idea to put us in such an isolated position, bereft of any real support, was the Brigadier's call. And my subsequent conversations with David Richards, obviously in, uh, with him writing his own book, um, you know, we've had some good conversations about the decision to isolate us and the ramifications of 26 guys being surrounded and, 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 and that. Um, and again, for the CO as well, a big call to put us out there and leave us kind of in that position. So he came out, mate, he was bouncing, you know, I've made the right decision, you know, well done PF and, and, and all that, and, um, and, and pretty happy. Sent a very clear message, you know, we're here to stay, the mission evolved, people were now out of Freetown, the role of one power had morphed into, into more into sort of, it'd gone from a, from a neo operation, a non-combatant evacuation operation, to almost a coin operation, so we'd now gone counterinsurgency, we're propping up the government, the President Cabba's government. And um, what we didn't know at that time is, as we were having that contact on the 17th of May, in the afternoon of the 17th of May, the leader of the IUF, Ford de Sanke, was captured in an intelligence operation in Freetown. So he'd been arrested at the same time, pretty much. Um, whether that had anything to coincidence i don't think so i think it would they just they just got him at the same time so wind on a little bit more and that's kind of the iuf a bit decapitated now so with what happened with us kind of really giving them this blow the realization that one power were on the ground and you know if, if this was going to happen when we face 26 guys what's going to happen if we try to take on 800 we've lost sort of for the Sanke, let's say he was the brains of the outfit. Um, I think that's just what what led them to descend into chaos. They broke down into smaller factions, into rivalry, and I think as a potent force, the IUF probably collapsed as a result of those two two actions happening simultaneously. Um, but to get back to the next day, that, that sort of, you know, Paul Gibson had pretty much sat us down and said, look guys, you've got to stay. I'm going to leave you here. Um, you know, I, even when you poke a hornet's nest, you know what I mean? He, he kind of realised that that wasn't the end of it, I think. Um, the OC, the one para guys, was wanting to stay because the realisation is what it would turn into. And I think it goes back to the original reasons why the PF were put there. <clears throat> um, you know, the ability to E&E &E through the jungle, um, the ability to, to, to operate in, in small teams, independent of each other was the reason why I think that we stayed and, 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 the, and the decision to, to take the one power away was. Um, so they were told that they would stay till the next morning. So they'd been on the ground. They'll be on the ground 24 hours and they would go out the next day, if you like. Um, at that point, CEO said, I'm going to support you with whatever I can now. 
Um, so we just knocked up a wish list, you know, as you do. More ammunition, claymores if they're in country, HE for the 51. And we went, be bold. We went bold and, and asked for three barrels. <laughs> What, 50 ones? No, 381. Oh, you got 80 ones? Oh, yeah. I see. We asked for three. We didn't know if we would get them. That's the. Yeah, we. Oh, no, the, whole, the battalion has nine, then. The battalion has nine, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So, um, so we asked for three. We didn't know if we'd get them. Um, we took the opportunity then, uh, throughout that sort of day. So, this is the day, uh, the day of the contact now. We're now in the day, like, two kind of. Sort ourselves out, get some sleep. One para took over all responsibility for the village for that period. You know, so they were manning checkpoints, manning the uh, manning the trenches, doing their little bit of clearance patrols. That gave us chance to admin, you know, clean weapons, um, get a little bit of kip, uh, you know, sort ourselves out and basically prepare for staying in the village. Uh, words of the CEO, I have no idea how long you're going to be here now. Just prepare to remain here until the end of the task, if you like. As isolated um, as you were before. As isolated yeah. as where we were before. Nothing had really changed. We hadn't been strengthened. We just asked for more ammunition, uh, and that was it. Um, CO stayed a couple of hours, had a look on the ground, shook everybody's hand, pat on the back, and left. Um, we stayed on the ground, as I said. One para took over duties. And uh, and we prepared for that night. Everybody thinking that if they were going to come back, it would be now. Um, so straight into nighttime routine. We've now got what fifty six, sixty ish, fifty six to sixty guys on the ground. I'm pretty sure there was about thirty of one para. You know, all in the defence. We still had the ten. Was it ten or twelve Nigerians? Remember, we still had them. We'd stuck them at the back of the village in two trenches. Um, well out of the way, strict instructions not to move, only point their weapons towards Lungi Airfield, never move, never get out the trench, never fire back into the village. <laughs> <laughs> because the last thing we wanted was them with, with their weapons running riot in the village, firing what is in effect 7.62. You know, in the dark, you have no idea. We'd brief the villagers. If it all goes loud, don't come out your hut. Don't move around in the village because we don't know who's friend or foe and you're going to get engaged. So they didn't. I mean, the girl got shot, I think, as making a mad dash between two huts, possibly. The girl who got it in the shoulder. But to be honest, no, the villagers got shot, which was absolutely amazing. Absolutely. I have no idea how. it how. Um, but just, just, to, just to point out on this, the... the, 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 the girl got shot by the rebels yeah and you're, oh, yeah, yeah, and you're yeah. saying it's amazing they even get shot by the rebels yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. yeah no yeah, she, yeah. she she must have yeah. just took a stray round flying through. i mean because obviously there's no there's no weapon discipline they're firing high they're firing low <laughs> they're firing in, in, into everything that they can see within the village um you know as I, and it goes back to my point possibly indiscriminate you know the whole holding on to it yee-haw firing from the hip in bursts of automatic I'd like to think that that's that that's what they were doing. There wasn't no cold, calculated marksmanship principles being applied. Um, so that's where we were that night. Um, you know, dark. You know, usual screams. Village very quiet. People just in the hut sleeping. Again, massive amount of people in the centre of the village just sleeping rough. Um, who, who you know who would come in for safety for safety mate yeah i reckon there was over a thousand people <coughs> in, in, in something that you could the whole village you would put on red square back in the battalion do you know what i mean it was a tiny piece of real estate um that took us to the next day um so it was about 11 o'clock mid-morning i remember bit about mid-morning Shouldn't have come in to take the one pair of guys out. Um, at the same time, ramp goes down. Ammunition's coming off for us that we'd requested. Great. Off the back comes 11 one pair of guys and three 81s. We oh. didn't think we were going to get them. Awesome. We just put a wish list in. <coughs> so we've now got three 81s with about 100 rounds per barrel. Do you have HE this time? Oh, yeah, they had HE. <laughs> yeah. So, of course, you know, you get that warm, fuzzy feeling now, don't you? Um, so the one pair of lads 
the, the the platoon of one para got on and left. We've now got thirty. Uh, we've now got eleven guys and and and, and three barrels with us. Um, we got the guys got the guys in, and and then we just left it up. To, we briefed the, uh, the 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 MFC that came in, told him exactly what had happened, and 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 pretty much left him to cite the mortars. Um, and as you know, with the speed of a thousand gazelles, those you know the guys are digging in. They're getting sandbags. They're getting the mortar line established. Um, the MFC sat with us. We're looking at the ground. We're picking off all of the points where we thought they must likely approach routes. Any area that we couldn't cover with fire. Um, and of course, he just he just recorded them. So they all got their X-ray numbers. And I think there was about eleven spots on the ground around the village, various ranges. Um, I think it's really important at this point that we kind of highlight that, you know, this it, this isn't open war fighting. This wasn't a uniformed enemy that we could identify. Civ pop moving in from lots of villages, people coming from every different direction, walking, coming out of the jungle and onto the track, using the track, coming up in old battered vehicles. The use of 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 mortar 81 ha at this point we, we were we were kind of really sort of thinking that how are we going to how are we going to use this there has to be some very clear here you've got to confirm that there's people with weapons masked you're taking fire from a particular point before we start you know dropping 81 millimeter ha on top of this because the collateral will be well yeah i mean yeah, yeah and you, we just it, it, you know and it, it, it's it's very sort of restrictive I know, 81, if I'm correct in saying, is it 40 metre radius, lethal radius? Oh. So from the point that the, from the point that the round goes off on the ground, 40 metre radius, so what, 80 metre diameter? Yeah, That's I mean, a lethal. So if you yeah, get hit there, that's lethal. I, I, yeah, I mean, I think and that goes, I mean, that, that might even push out to splinters, splinters and fragmentation at 100, Oh, it goes on beyond that, yeah, I think whatever. it doubles, mate, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and plus massive. that, if you're yeah. dropping that in amongst <clears> trees and, and all the rest of it, it's, yeah. you know, it, it's it, it's seeing it land. I mean, we and again, you know, you're back to the old days of, I mean, you know, when was the last time the British Army dropped mortars in a jungle environment, in a canopy, where adjusting is, uh, you, you know, that's... Um, so, again, most of the most of the DFs were recorded out in the open, track junctions, Fern Gully, places where we thought they'd mass the, tra the railway line. And then, obviously, the big one, if we were going to get overrun, the sort of FPF was us. Um, again, very, very strict on that. You know, the MFC said, I'll fire the FPF, but... That pretty much means we've been overrun. The mortars are no more used here, and that call obviously needed to come from Grant. Um, we factored them into the E and E plan. The idea, remember, we had one pins gower. The idea at this point was that the last thing we want is three mortar barrels and 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 three hundred rounds of H E and a loom falling into the wrong hands. So the whole E and E plan was, you know, if it becomes untenable, if we're surrounded, if we're suddenly become engulfed and, and it's looking like we can't win the day, um, at that point the mortars, you collapse everything on the pins and you 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 get yourself out of dodge as fast as possible. We'll make our way with our original E and E on foot as as, as best we can. Um so, so that was it. Mortars up and running. Um, bit of an update from the bit of an update because again we had the EW. EW was in then, you know. Mobile, the, the electronic, electronic warfare. warfare guys were in. You know, you know that, you know the the, the 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 spooks were operating out of out of um, Freetown. You know, by that stage, you know the the informer network and all the rest of it's up and running and. Um, so we're getting a bit more of an in, in update, you know, because I believe most of their comms was mobile phones, Rebels. So, bit of an update, um, and that was it. We just prepared ourselves. So we're now at. So that was day. So we're probably on day eleven now. We're on day eleven, um, and they stayed with us um, till day sixteen. Um, nothing ever happened. Lots of noises, lots of movement. That first night that they were in, we put up, I think we put up 52 loom rounds or something ridiculous. Lots of movement. So basically, the, the, the sort of, the, the brief was, patrol commanders, anybody sees anything, you call for a loom. They would fire a loom. If we could identify, if we could identify anybody, then, then we would switch to HE, but a loom. But again, it was, the loom was up, movement, 
shadows, noises. Um, again, everyone's on edge, aren't they? You know, we just didn't know what to expect. Um, nothing. All quiet. Kind of an anticlimax, to be perfectly honest. So we've gone from that initial adrenaline pumping action nothing on the sort of fighting patrol but getting out there still keeping up that momentum getting the mortars in hoping for round two and nothing so that sort of next five days was pretty much routine it was pretty much presence on the ground the good thing about it is being a coin operation we're now completely sort of hearts and minds and anybody that sort of has that sort of understanding of coin operations coin operations only work when you're providing a blanket of security you know surging troops in and out of areas very sort of what the americans were doing in somalia and places like that and mogadishu is that if you're surging in and out you're not creating the conditions for security and confidence us being on the ground with the villagers allowed them to think that they're we were going to be able to fight for them. There was this constant blanket of security and they got on with their life, to be honest. The village came back to life. It was a trading post um, and there was some semblance of normality. At this point, remember when I told you that we thought that we were going to be relieved by 4-2 Commando? Mm -hmm. The idea was that the Brigade Patrols Troop, BPT, so the Marines version of the Pathfinders, was going to relieve us. Or at least the recce platoon from 4-2. 4-2 had sailed on HMS Ocean. They were now off Freetown. We thought they were gonna they, they were gonna relieve us. So that's what we were expecting. Day 15, radio message in the afternoon, you're withdrawn en masse tomorrow morning, 0830, helicopter from resupply, HLS, that was it. Of course, no mention of resupply. We all know where a relief in place is. You don't leave until the relieving troops are in. They're brief. They understand the ground. They're in your positions. And then you withdraw. It became very evident at that point that there wasn't anybody coming into the village. Whatever decision had been made, whatever troops were available, whatever other taskings had happened outside of the village, nobody was going to come to the village. As you can imagine, we'd been there 16 days. Blokes, you know, kids, they were playing with the kids now. And, uh, they, you know, they, they were they were getting our water for us. They were teaching the blokes how to cook scoff and preparing scoff while we were stagging on. Um, there was that real great hearts and minds. And, um, you know, we actually started knowing people by their names. Um, so when we got the message that we were going to go... Uh, it was kind of the unenviable task of Grant and Wag. They went to speak to the to the village elder and basically let him know that we were leaving. And, of course, his first thing was through through Lieutenant Mojo, uh, the translator, was that, who's going to come? Who's going to relieve you? No one. Blokes were gutted. It was, it was heart-wrenching, mate, to be perfectly honest. Absolutely heart-wrenching. I suppose the worry... Was that then you would leave and then the rebels would come in at some stage, massacre the fucking village for, for having cooperated? Yeah. In, uh, uh, you know, not that they had the choice of you coming in, but they welcomed it. Is that, no, I take it that's the worry? Yeah, I mean, usual, usual. well, yeah. it, it, it's it's exactly the same mentality as, as uh, you know, as, as Afghanistan. And I said I didn't serve in Afghanistan, but the mentality there is that, you know, you have the watches, we have the time type sketch. At some point, you're going to leave. All they got to do is sit and wait it out, which is, you know, which, which which is sort of, you know, what we were thinking. You know, why would the school bully, why didn't the school bully just wait and wait and wait until whoever's protecting the playground leaves and then he's free to come back in and do what he wants? That was probably the thought at the time, very similar to what you've just said there, mate, is that you poke a hornet's nest uh, with a stick and what are you going to expect? Um, so yeah it was pretty devastating mate to be honest a really difficult time them them sort of hours patrol commander's not very happy very vocal not a lot you can do mate um, so we spent that last night night 15 in the jungle 8 o'clock the next morning so again we had a vehicle we couldn't get it on the Chinook so basically I tasked one of the patrols take the vehicle on my well, you know get his patrol <coughs> on the vehicle and drive it back again there's always a risk if we have been sort of enveloped and moved around us. It's a bypass policy. We would do it, wouldn't we? If there was a stronghold, you just bypass it and move on. If they're not on 
if by bypassing them you don't lose anything tactically so we didn't know what was that sort of 35 kilometers between us and the airfield um so they set off chinook came in and we kind of walked down the sort of central street now you know whatever many there was left of us so there was 20 of us six had gone on the vehicle 20 of us plus the 11 guys with all the kit it was like those days walking into pristina everyone's lying in the street watching you wondering what you're doing where you're going um and the next thing we're on a chinook flying over the village 16 days to you know with exactly that same with that pro that thought in your mind is what is going to happen totally expecting here that the village was on fire sometime a few hours later mm. so that was us mate on route back to lungi airfield um 35 minutes later we're on the ground walking off the back to 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 to, to, to that hive of activity um the same as what it was when we'd left 16 days before um we got in debriefed by that stage as inevitably everything that ever happens once things dies down everything goes to peacetime reporting so you're now accounting for ammunition you're now trying to justify how much is gone, where it's gone, how much you had. Well, we didn't know. You know, of course, we didn't reckon when we got it in there and then you get resupply. But, you know, then the questions, where's all the ammo? What ammo has gone? How much was fired? And um, it's not no, it's it's no fault of the battalions. It's just it's just the way the, 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 the system is, isn't it? The battalion now has to account for everything it's got. It's used. Um, it got worse, mate. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, I mean, it's just so. That was us debrief and we're now you know we're now we're now sort of mid-morning on that day I haven't done a debrief cleaning the kit deathly silence among the blokes um just wondering a how long what's happening now how long we're going to be here what's the next task waiting for the next task um to be told probably the next day is that we were we were going back UK. Elements from one part. So if you imagine, uh, one para battle group, one of the companies, A Company, didn't deploy because they were in Kenya. So when one para deployed, oh, yeah, but they got barrassed, didn't they? Ah, uh, the next yeah. year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So A Company weren't on that op. So uh, two para supplied a rifle company to, to, to sort of plug the gap within the battle group. So within... Within within us being back in Lungi Airfield, twenty four hours, the first the first Herc transport aircraft out of there, back to Dakar, um, went. So two para went first, um, with elements of the PF. <clears throat> so as so we were probably back in that airfield, twenty four thirty six hours tops, and we were back heading back to the UK. I think we were in country for. Well, definitely less than 28 days. I'd say we were in country. In fact, we were probably in country 16, 18, 20, 22 days. 22 days, something like that. Um, yeah, and we were back, uh, you know, back to uh, back to UK. Well, did, did it um, did it feel like... Uh, well, let's go back. At that point, what you'd achieved there on that, in 2000 was... was, was uh, was pretty was was unique for that time um you know the type of operation it was then with pf going on and and, and like given given the the rebels that bloody nose being involved in an engagement um type of engagement that hadn't happened for fucking years mate did it feel like uh, as you we were talking about there leaving the village did it feel like a bit of um uh sense of you achieved a lot of experience on the ground you know within pf especially with the with the contacts but uh, a lack of uh, a lack of achievement, practically, in a sense, achievement for what you'd brought to Freetown, what you brought to uh, um, Lungi Lai. Well, I mean, yeah. So, sort of to look at it, then. I'm not. Um, I'm not saying it was. A, I'm not saying you didn't achieve anything. It's not. I'm no, just, I mean, I'm, it, it I'm wasn't thinking measurable. Mind, what I'm trying to think in my mind yeah. is all all the stuff I all all the, the ops I've been on. Yeah. Um. I've been there for a significant period of time, and it's and it's gone on, and and so there's a plan, and we we go towards some way towards achieving that plan, the strategy, whatever it may be, as part of the overall campaign. So I've always managed to get that. I've not had to deal with what the fuck were you here for. 
and, and I, so I'm just thinking from a third person. What was it like being that? Because for me, I don't know how I cope with that, mate. Like it's such a short deployment, albeit high, highly kinetic in, in parts, and very fluid for the whole thing, and then to be off the ground almost as quick as you were on there. Hmm. What? Yeah. What was that? What was it like? What was it? Well, it goes back to to what you said. There isn't no, there wasn't no measurable, there wasn't no measurable sort of end state at that point. Yeah. But it's only when you come back and we, we sort of. So the first thing we've done, obviously, is looking to make sure that the village was never attacked again. Uh, and, and so we're trying to get information. When you go back to the yeah, UK, yeah. So we're, we're you know we're trying to get post op reports. We're trying to get information back from obviously four two commando. Then we're in situ. Nobody came into the village. They didn't replace us. Four two commando decided that they didn't have anyone to put in the village. Because of it was so isolated, they didn't put anybody in. Okay. Um, so, but it was afterwards. It, it was only afterwards when we kind of fully absorbed what it was. And 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 let's put so. On short notice, a task force from the UK went and stopped incredible brutality in its tracks. We evacuated not only British personnel but obviously, uh, you know, entitled personnel from a range of other countries. So they were taken out. The country was stabilised to a certain degree. So the belligerents in all of this, the RUF at the time, were, were I'd like to say, were disemboweled. So the head was taken off. Fort de Sanko was removed. Such a... Stopped in their tracks from advancing. Later, subsequently, and, and again, from, from all the briefs afterwards, they kind of collapsed and became almost impotent and went back to what they were, was just street gangs, which obviously subsequently then rise to, you know, was how the West Side boys elevated themselves in the number one position. Um, so from an operational point of view, Highly, su highly, highly successful. successful. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, t t for a battle group to move and 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 from from a start line and twenty four days later to have achieved so much, um, I think was and and it goes back and I had this conversation with with David Richards, Brigadier Richards, when he became chief of the defence staff, was that it it's now been it's now been touted as a textbook intervention operation. The textbook <laughs> intervention operation. Apart from the 40 rounds at the start. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, I mean. Absolutely right. But, yeah. but, but, but again, but, but even if you look at that, okay, yeah, the, we, so the, joking, the, the joking, yeah, no, yeah, but I'm yeah. saying, but, but everything has a, everything has, everything happens so that we can grow and develop and all the rest of it. So, okay, whatever lessons we learned of that on the combat service support side, but again, you know, troops on the ground, making the best of it, securing, you know, doing what we do best. Um, the whole British Army, that sort of force for good, everything that makes the British Army and, and its supporting elements. I mean, don't forget, you know, you, you know, so we had the Chinook flights in. They made the longest helicopter transit ever. Um, you know, we've got, you know, HMS Ocean, the Navy being redirected and making their way at full steam. So that whole sort of tri-service testing of the of, of, of the British services led to something that our allies, including the Americans, have, have subsequently said could not have been done. Mm. So, you know, take it that. For the bloke's point, being in the jungle, the British Army had never fought in the jungle since the Malaya conflict and the Malaya emergency. So that was 45 years. We'd never fought in the jungle for 45 years, yet we practice there because it's the place to hone your skills. And if you can fight and survive and admin yourself in the jungle, as we know, that's why it's used on, 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 on every kind of course. And, it, it, you know, it's part of, you, you know, the selection process for everybody is that you go there to confirm your skills. Um, so for us as a unit, we, we you know, SOPs, we, you know, we all know you don't change SOPs unless you've had that operationally experience to adjust it so we learned as a unit we learned a lot of lessons ourselves about how we react what we should hold in store you know where people should be at certain times it it, it highlighted what other courses need to be done so for us when we sat down and looked at the lessons learned element of it and and and, and drafted up the sort of post-op report for us it was a it was a very sort of very detailed, objective look at us as a unit, and I think for us it was a very pivotal moment in the in the evolution of the of the PF. Yeah, you mentioned that on the last podcast. Just to go back, when I was talking about, um, I don't want to play it down there. We're talking about the uh, 
that how, how did you deal with that? What, what was that like? That, I meant like the sort of the mental aspect, mm. talking about the civvies and leaving them there. I, I wasn't talking about the whole thing. Yeah. I, I didn't mean, I didn't, in case it came across, I didn't mean no, to insinuate no, the fucking thing. It wasn't success. No, I, was, no. I was meaning to talk, coin ops. You were talking a lot about hearts and minds and, and, and so I just wanted to make that point. But, um, yeah, you mentioned that on, on the last podcast about, you mentioned it briefly about you, you felt that that was a, a pivotal moment for PF. What I, what I like from listening to you, mate, now and before, what I, what I like about that op is, um, is the risks that the battle group were willing to take. Um, which I which I think those risks that were that the, the British forces were willing to take with people's lives to on operations w- 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 was reduced over the time since I, since I left two thousand eleven and it came less and less and less. They were less willing to to risk lives in favour of tactics and strategy because that's what needs to be done. Which 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 is as you know, mate, from that up, you you gotta. You've got to put faith in the ability of of the people you've got on the ground. Um, whether you, uh, whether you think they're as capable as they should be or not, sometimes, regardless, you have to put the faith in them and, and, and put risk out and put people on the ground that like you were thirty five kilometers into the jungle with no fucking support, mate, and then you get bumped mm. <laughs> on that first night to, to be able to achieve. Because if that hadn't, hadn't happened, well. PF wouldn't really give the RAF a bloody nose, and then caught, I'd be partially cause of, cause the, the downfall of them, along with the um, the uh, leader getting caught in Freetown. And you guys, at PF now, wouldn't be the force they are now, arguably. Mm-hmm. Fair to say. Yeah, I, 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 absolutely. I mean, you know, I, and it goes back to the whole sort of thing of the, the, the strengths, our strengths. Um, you know. You can't have an army of of eighty three thousand pe- of of eighty three thousand people, and be such a force. I mean, yeah, okay. Don't get me wrong. The battle group was overextended. There's no doubt about it. It was overextended. Was there mission creep? Absolutely. Did it evolve into something else? Absolutely. Um, did Brigadier Richards take risks on the ground? Absolutely. Um, could it have all gone pear shaped? No, incredibly. But again, it goes back to that, as you've touched on there, mate, is the ethos. That sort of what we do better than anyone else. And what we do better than anyone else, mate, is we have is mission command. That sort of decentralization of the decision making process. You get your mission. So you get the you get the, the specified task, but you don't get the implied. And that's where you know, commanders on the ground, everything from our lance corporals, you know, our great thinking Toms, all the way to our lance corporals, to our section commanders making operational decisions in pursuit of the, you know, in line with the intent. Um, and that's what happened on the ground. Lots of people making very sort of informed decisions, short on resources, but high on capability. And I think that op, I think that op served the British Army and all of it, and 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 uh, you know that linkage between the other services, but I only seen it from from the sort of mil- sort sort of from the army point of view. We didn't get involved. We didn't, you know, short of using the Chinooks to get in and out. We didn't have a lot to do with the uh, the air force element, and we never saw uh, the marines. So I can't understand what the naval element for. It. I just understand the big picture of of what it took to move and position those pieces so that there was you know one para could be relieved and. 4-2 could come in and then subsequently all the short-term training team tasks that went on leading up to up to Barris and the Royal Irish is that people on the ground, you know, taking command of the of the country, getting people trained up, you know, re-establishing infrastructure and, 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 and leadership and a rule of law. Um, so personally, mate, upon reflection and when we came back, I think it was difficult to handle that we just, you know, it was a very long time before you stopped thinking that something was going to happen to them villages. Um, but we were subsequently, you know, all the time reassured that the village, was, and it wasn't, it was never attacked again. It was, it, it, it remained, let's say, peaceful, which, which brings a certain amount of sort of, you know, a certain amount of closure to it, to, to that, um, to that element, you know, to, to that final chapter is that we flew out and they all got to live their life in peace, which was... Yeah, and something uh, um, reminded me of something I've, I've, uh, I've had a lot of discussions with 
<coughs> on the podcast enough around, you know, what was the point of Afghan and the campaign in Iraq and that kind of thing. And one of the one of the things I've said is, um, you know, even if you have to stay there in Sierra Leone for like, a, I don't know, a year, two years, whatever, it's very difficult to change it completely for the, to be as best as it can be. Oh no, to be as, as good as, you know, first world is, right? But then if you're able to go into a, into a, um, as part of an operation, you're able to go into a village or, or villages or a town or city and have a, and have a positive impact. And even if that positive impact is, is simply, um, representing, uh, a, an ethical, morally, um, correct individual from a different country, i.e. British soldiers in a village on the, on the, on the fringes of a free town, um, who have never come across, you know, you guys before, um, or the British before in that capacity, but they have with the UN and things. And you go on there, you make a good impression, and you, you know, you're not flipping, raping, and pillaging like r crazy forces are, right? And then that's a good thing, mate. You know, yeah, you can't stay there and 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 make sure they're all right for the for the next year until the RUF or two years, three years until the RUF are completely gone or the rebels are completely gone. We can never do that anyway. But it's still a positive impact in that short term, and that's better than nothing, right? Um, and that's just from the, you know, the, the coin ops, hearts and minds perspective. Uh, and I suppose that's something that, um, is, is, a uh, is a way of looking at any campaign like that, I think, or operation like that, I think, you know? Yeah. I mean, and it goes back to the whole sort of, you know, the, the, the British military, all three services were a brand. And I think that's what we have to understand now. And it's. It, it's that ability for the brand to go into these places and um, and give a good account of itself, you know, and and we go, we go back to the whole punching above our weight, and and, and there's lots of components and, and and reasons for that. But I have no doubt in my mind, and I, and I've wrote about it and, and and spoke about it on several occasions. We're viewed as a force for good because we are a highly ethical you know, very sort of courageous, both morally and physically uh, courageous organisation, you know, this UK PLC, very courageous uh, and, and we understand um, and we use our our limited might for good um, and, and to be able to come away from Sierra Leone, you know, the big thing when we went there was these, you know, and what we got to see was they had AMP camps, AMP as in AMP, the signature atrocity for the RUF was amputation of hands. So they had long sleeve and short sleeve, and they gave you the choice. So long sleeve was they took your arm below below the elbow. Short sleeve, they took it above the elbow, and they gave you the choice in the village before they took your arm. Sickly in their mind, two reasons. One, that, because it's threatening and, 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 and it's danger. But the, you know what the, the other one was, that if... In the future, if there was any voting or any legal representative, you couldn't vote. You couldn't cast a vote to put anybody in government in power. Um, it, it, I mean, I, we find it difficult to, to sort of justify a thought process like that. But um, so you going in and you go into these villages and you see kids running around with no hands and no arms. And they just used to take the arms. They didn't take the legs. They took the arms because then they can't look after themselves they can't plow the field they can't build homes and you know so they you know they're dead anyway as a result of that um so to come away after 24 days or 25 days however the, how long the battle group there was and that okay it didn't stop per se but it went a significant way mm -hmm. to stopping that yeah and, and, and bringing some semblance to order and then the subsequent deployment of another highly effective force within the commandos so two back-to-back -back deployments bringing even more stability and then subsequently short-term training teams going in there and propping up their police and government and training you know so that continuous presence on the ground of these highly effective motivated morally driven troops um helped to sort of really sort of set the set the set the journey again for, for and, and allow the sierra leone to you know, to, to get back, like you said, to mm. some semblance of, of, of normality. Mm -hmm. 
How did um how did it uh did it affect the way you uh, looked at your career, looked at your looked at the unit, looked at your position with the, within the military? Yeah. Done up. Mm. Well, I mean, I, I I think I think coming back from Sierra Leone was the, the so the next six months because we came back in May, I was out. Oh, I yeah, was out in right, I yeah. was out seven months later. Um it was the whole process and, and, and let me get you know, and, and I wanna be very clear here. I you know the British Army turned me and, and, and created and, 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 and turned me into the into the person I am and I'll be forever thankful. And 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 when I wrote Mayhem, I'm very conscious that you know it isn't a stick to beat anything with. It it just me you know, there was mistakes. There's equipment deficiencies, lots of things, you know, clansman radios not working, systems not working. And 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 I wanted to be very clear that that things could be done better. If you're going you know, it's like I like I said, I didn't serve in Af Afghan but you can't wait till the conflict is upon you before you start urging operational requirements and purchasing some stuff off the shelf. You know, that whole, everything, that, that whole sort of development process and equipment manning and levels and, 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 and realising what the threat and the potential threats of the future are going to be and preparing for it now, not waiting till, the, you, you know, the horse is bolted and then suddenly realising that, you know, why, how can you have a magazine fed support weapon like the LSW and then having to go out and buy belt fed, you know, 5.56 minimes? When did that happen? Well, all those urgent operational oh, requirements, on, yeah, I'm yeah, saying yeah, we yeah. didn't have them, but no, we're, yeah. we're, we're involved in Afghan, we're involved in, in, in Iraq before we realised that we need a firepower upgrade. It became, and, it became, uh, it became madness, mate. Yeah. Um, no, no, it didn't become madness. It was madness from the start. It's one of those things. It's one of the annoying things that you probably had this discussion a million times. It was annoying things that you know, as experienced a military as we are, the British, as experienced as the Americans are, albeit a lot less, they've only been around two hundred years. Uh, we don't we don't seem to learn from all the lessons we can learn from until we're two or three operations into a campaign that we could have used as lessons at the start you know exactly talk about lmgs the lsw um i i don't understand why that is yeah. but those uors they changed that process uh, if, um about uh, well we're afghan fuck me man it took it took like four four years five years from the start of afghan then to realize that the urgent operational requirement was needed and like a review you know so we as an example on on the in 2006 when we deployed that tour the sniper rifles for example um the the scopes the the magnification wasn't high enough what we were doing and and the elevation drum because we were engaging it much further than what we thought you could engage at uh so harassing fire they thought like the um they thought the 338 could harass it on paper, it was harassing fire was something like fourteen hundred meters, and harassing fire for safe pop listening means you can fire around first round, your first round shot at a target, and it'll land close enough to them. Probably isn't going to hit them, but close enough to them to fucking scare them. And that's called that's harassing fire. And they thought the three three eight could do fourteen hundred meters. I think it was. I was doing it two and a half k. Um, I was doing it two and a half k in Kajaki. But it was a nightmare because the scope needed to, the elevation drum wouldn't go up high enough. Mm. Need, the, the scope was the wrong scope. Do you know how long it took to change that? Two years. <laughs> yeah. That's 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 four more operations of other people going on the ground having the same fucking problem. Yeah. You know, it's, I, I don't know why that is. Maybe it'll change down the line. I don't think it will. It just, yeah. I mean, and like you said, I mean, it 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 it's it's something that that I find. I I found it very disheartening at the time. I, I you know, if you're going to send people. Into the into the arena, if you're going to send people into arena, then they need to be armed. They need to be equipped. You know, you can't go on operations and realise that it's a body armour between four. You can't go on operations and realise that. Why isn't everybody got a secondary weapon? You can't go on operations and realise that, you know, you haven't got the ability to to 
to fire 40 millimeter grenades. You haven't got this. You haven't got, you know, inter patrol comms are not secure and there's a brick. You know, you can't. All of this stuff that could be sorted out now as a result of what's happening, you know, um, it just seems to me that, you know, we we wait. We wait till we're engaged. We wait until the point that we're engaged before we realise that, you know, we, we, there's so many deficiencies. And when I came back from, when we came back from Sierra Leone and, and you know, and, you know, blokes were having to leave, the, the three, four, nines, they were having to leave them out in the sun during the day to dry because we got, you, you, you know, it was raining and every, you know, it was, it, it's that sort of equatorial climate, you know, so it was, it would absolutely flood the village in rain for about 20 minutes. You'd get, you'd get six inches of rain. Then it would be baking sunshine. But so, you know, radio's not working. If it wasn't for the fact that we scrounged a Thoraya sat phone, our first, the first contact report the PF has ever sent was sent on a Thoraya civilian, co you know, because, because the 319s weren't working. It just, it's enough to get you back up. And I came back and we did all the, you know, we did the lessons learned, we did the reviews, we looked at kit, we had problems, you know, everything through the SE80 and, 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 and all of the issues that we had. And and you and and you put forward these suggestions and 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 recommendations, and there's just inactivity. There's just inactivity, and um, and for me it kind of. I don't know, was I being a petulant child and thinking, you know, it was never going to change? I don't know. I just got to the point where as, I just, you know. I, I, I don't know. I just got to the point where I made the decision that, you know, that um, that, that I was going to leave. Um, because it wasn't until we came back in the May, I didn't find out until the November that I, on the honours list, that I got the MC. I didn't know. So we'd been back five months. I didn't know. By that stage, I'd already made the decision to leave. So when I went for my investiture, I was out of the army. So when I went to the palace, I went in civvies because I was out, um, w w which was which which was devastating. It was devastating. Um, yeah, what, what do you mean? In what way? Because you because you weren't. I was out, and I, you know, and and there would have been nothing greater than uh, you know to 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 have gone in uniform and still carried on my career. I don't know. Um, I just felt. You know, because like I said, I was out of the army. I left in the, I left, I went on gardening leave in the January of 2001. Um, so, and I didn't, the investiture wasn't until April 2001. So I'd been out three months. I was in a new job. Um, yeah, it was just, I don't know. I look back on it now and, um, you know, and I did contemplate re-enlisting. Because pretty much nine eleven, I was walk. I was walk, I was working in London at the time. I was, uh, I was heading up a C. I was on a CP team. I was walking into work, and uh, nine eleven happened, and it was you know that the whole sort of towers had happened, and I was in work. I just got in that morning, and I, I was like, oh, right, there is good. There's guys on planes now. <laughs> there's guys packing kit now, and I was like, right, shall I re-enlist? You know, I even phoned up. The, the the OC the PF and he said if you want to come back come back same rank come back in who was the OC uh, guy called Liam Cradden mm. he's Reggie Colonel now mm. awesome guy it's interesting now you mention the MC mate because um, now we haven't got time for it now I know we should talk part but, three but, but um, <laughs> <laughs> no but well yeah <laughs> but um, you've obviously dressed over shit in that battle on the pod, on the first podcast. Which is, well, I need to read this book. <laughs> I need to read this book. <laughs> you've uh, you've spoken you know, you you've that, spoken Tom. about it incredibly modest, incredibly modestly, mate. Um, incredibly modestly. Uh, yeah, I, I'm going to read this book. I need to read this book and read the detail in it. For that military cross was fucking alley. I mean, congratulations on that, but congratulations on it. Because listening to that, um, listen to the uh, you talk through it in the first podcast. Um, some pretty hairy shit you did, mate. I wouldn't have gone fucking <laughs> crawl out, crawl out of the current, in, out in, in with with the mortar. Um, 
Yeah, I am. Um, I'll have to read it, mate. Uh, but going back, do you think? Do you think that um, wanted to get back in potentially was just because there was a um, there was there was more ops going on and uh, FOMO, fear of missing out? Yeah. Hundred percent. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. I mean, and and the other thing as well is that, um, you know, I, I, you know, when you've, you know, with, and and I find it difficult. Um, let's get the words right. So, I mean, for me, you know, being in the being in the platoon, being in the in, in the PF, you know, it was it was, you know, it was it was very special, very special. Um, you know, and 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 of course, because we are sort of umbilical to the brigade and constantly surrounded by the reg and and fed from, you know, I mean, when I left, we were tri service selection then, so we were taking, you know, we'd had marines come on the course, we'd had REF regiment come on the course, and and that, so it was, I think after Sierra Leone was the turning point, and the development of the PF, their role, their equipment, the way that they were being deployed, the whole development of the Pathfinder Group and the Brigade Reconnaissance Force kind of went stratospheric at that point. And I think it would have been a great time to be involved. Um, and so there was that. And the fact, back on ops, you know, and, and we're all, we're all, you know, we're all selfish, aren't we? We all just want that. You know, we all wanted that ops because there was such, there was such a period of inactivity, wasn't there? I mean, the drawing down of Ireland and and, and everything. There was that period where, you, you know, we didn't get to do anything, and then all of a sudden, from sort of two thousand, it just went mental, didn't it? For whatever twelve, thirteen years, um, yeah. So there was that, and and as you said, four more position thinking to yourself, back with the blokes, back on ops, testing. Doing what you what you love. Um, I think that, I think that's one of the biggest things is that when you when you deploy for the first time, uh, no, not deploy. When you're involved in a in um, when you, you get your first, probably like when you had your, your that very first the first contact on the first night. Probably you know that first time it happens, and because I, and you realise fucking hell, I'm pretty good at this. Or I didn't flap. Or I didn't you know. I, I was hundred percent of this, and it's relief because up to those up to that point, for anyone, regardless of your rank, regardless of how many you know ops you've been on before, without experiencing a, a, a battle like that, for just once, even just once, mate, you you never you you never know you you never you can never confirm in your head was I when the shit is the fan. Could I cut the mustard? So whether you've done it like once or a million times, it's the first time that counts. When you and you know this, because you, you know in your head. When I think about it, it has on the back of my exam, and it's it's like I think, yeah, I know. And the shit is a fan. Mm. In the in the worst possible way, when someone's trying to kill you, I can fucking handle this. And not only that, I can handle it myself, and I can make as you as a com- as a commander, you know, you can make those critical decisions. You can have, you can act in the best possible way, in the most hideous of circumstances, most dangerous of circumstances. Not only looking after yourself, but looking after the, the people under your command. And I think that, um, I think that that one thing, when you understand that, and you and you can, and you have faith in yourself, mate. You you just want to go back and keep doing it because it's the sharp end of the spear. And that's that. I think that's that FOMO where the ops is. You just want to keep going back. I can do this. Let's go and do it again because this is the hardest thing I'll ever do in my life. It's the most dangerous thing I'll ever do in my life, and I'm fucking good at it. Oh, it's like I mean, yeah, professional athletes. You know, whatever yeah. sportsman, whatever. Unless you physically, it doesn't matter how much training you have done. It doesn't matter how many miles miles you've cycled. Unless you're actually on the mountain stage of the Tour de France, you don't know how good you are. You don't know how you're going to react. So all of the rehearsals, all of the training, all of the exercises are great, but you don't know. And as you've said, it's that clarity of thought. How do you balance courage with caution? How do you inspire those people who are looking to you 
for that sort of guidance? How do you create the conditions where people have got so much confidence and they believe that with you, they are better off without you? Um, on a personal point of view, yeah. How do you, you know, can I compartmentalize? Have I, has all that resilience work paid off? You know, can I control emotion, fear? I'm not, we haven't developed we haven't developed a medication yet that will that that will take a, a feeling away. The resilience in us is how do we ring fence that feeling and then continue to act. So I'm I'm scared. I'm petrified. Adrenaline's coursing through my veins. There's doubt. There's anxiety. But their emotions I can not control them. But what I can do is fence them off and act upon it. Um, and I think it's until you've until you've had that sweat sand blood on your face um i don't think you'll ever know and i think that's you know something that all soldiers need at least once yeah not just soldiers you know yeah. or, or, i mean I well think... yeah i mean and anything in the services anything fighter pilots you, you know the minute they're engaged or in a dog fight or they're on a bombing run whatever um it's that confidence that all the training all the work all the preparation everything that you have done and for a just cause um, is now coming to fruition. Yeah, I think that um, it's a good point. Since so now, you know, to the two thousand was that was like the start of craziness for twelve, thirteen years. Thinking about it, I think the position that the the British military is in now, and the veterans, I think that as a nation, if you you know the the amount of people we got in in the British population at the moment, or the or the UK population, it might not be British, but UK population, it's probably the most experienced, militarily experienced, regardless of what service you come from, regardless of what you do within that service, Army, Navy, RAF, probably the most experienced you've been. And I can't think how long. How long was the Second World War? Well, five years. Six well, years. Six years. No, I, I'm not, no. Granted, I know what you mean. Granted, yeah. there were a fuckload of people more involved in the Second World War. But what I'm talking about, we got 13 years of people, 13 years worth of hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands mm. Of people who are experienced in 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 military campaigns, probably yeah, I'd argue since the Second World War, probably the most experienced in the nation now, militarily they are now, and and the good thing about that is that I would suggest those people involved we're probably the most mentally resilient in certain generations as we could be. A lot of those people are out now. A lot of those people have been in you know um, and done those operations in 2000, 2013. Look at the look at the quality. Look at the quality of people we have in the veterans in Civvy Street now. There's a ma it's a much bigger proportion than, than, than previously I'd argue, just because of this span of operation, like you said, we have twelve or thirteen years, mate. Such and there's huge value in it. And you know, and 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 and, and I think it's it's becoming more more um people are becoming more aware of that now employers are more um swinging more towards, you know, uh, be more likely to employ veterans and have stigmas that they were there before. Um which leads me nicely on to X Platoon, mate. We got about um there we go. Tell me about tell me about um, your company, X Platoon. Because you're on the book, X Platoon, then Operation yeah. Mayhem. Tell me about your company. We didn't get the chance to get talk about it earlier. When did X Platoon start? Um, it it started it started in its current form two years ago. Um, so I came when I left the military, and and I did, I very very quickly I went out to work in the UAE, and um, I ended up on a, a a private contract, and I went out there as um. You know, so it was just at 9-11 and we went out there to establish um, what in effect became a cross between Brecon and Warminster. So it was called the Combat Training Centre, fell under the Special Operations Command um, and it was for training. Pick. So I ended up... For the UAE military. For the UAE. Yeah. So I went out there on a two-year contract as an instructor. There was half a dozen Power Edge guys, a couple of SF um, and um, and we set up and we said, oh, it morphed into a 14 year contract, um, grew beyond, you know, it went from uh, about 11 of us being in country in 2002 to close to 350 being in country later. So I ended up being there, ran the combat training center, chief advisor, had a, a oh, big, yeah, yeah oh, so I, the chief, had, I had a, I had a big workforce under me lots of two uh, well one two three para guys um half a dozen marines couple of sf guys and as a team we developed this uh, this center i came back in 2015 
immediately dropped into sort of the leadership motivational speak my brother was a professional footballer so i had an inroad into sort of the elite sports world um looking at um development motivation team building cohesion discipline looking at youth development within the academies um so i was doing that doing a lot of speaking it then sort of it then went into education um, I then kind of, I, I, I developed a program to work with children that are disengaged, 11 to 16 year old on the point of being excluded from mainstream school, disengaged, behavioral difficulties, um, issues in the classroom. So I developed a program to go into schools and using military values and ethos and, uh, and, and to, to, to sort of reinforce classroom work, to work with them. So I was doing that and um, and I realized that wouldn't it be great if I could do all of that outdoors? You know, take people, take corporations on, uh, on corporate businesses on value teams, ethics, building that network or, you know, sort of validate and strategy planning, looking at education. So the whole thing. So that's when I kind of reformed Expertune. So the so Expertune has three three elements to it, three facets to the business. So we have the education element, and I hope to be able to build an academy um, within the next five years as well. So that there is so we're looking at getting children outside, re, looking at resilience, health and well being, arming them with real life skills, um, looking at communication, how you become successful, the understanding of being part of a team. <clears throat> We have the corporate element in the middle that works the same with with so i'm looking at i now work with sort of um elite sports i'm working with premiership clubs i'm working with some clubs in the championships um and again building that sort of team ethos leadership in into their structures and we have an overseas element so our, we we take people overseas so i've got four trips we do the desert the jungle um i've got the arctic going in march 2020 we take 16 people to Sweden, I've partnered up with, um, when I was in the PF, we used to do a lot of trips uh, to, to Sweden, winter survival, uh, the head of the SF training wing at the time, um, was a good friend of mine, we kept in touch, he's now out, he has a business similar to mine, so we've partnered up, so we do a, a eight days Arctic um, survival course, uh, we've got a camp built, um, in, 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 in northeast Sweden. So you're 365 kilometers inside the Arctic Circle. Um, <laughs> and we take people in, you know, we do, you know, survival, you do husky dogs, mush your own husky dog team, snowmobiles, you know, underneath the Northern Lights, we've got a camp built. It's, you know, it's good food at the end of the day. There's even a sauna and it's really sort of that whole escapism. Um, yeah, so that's where we're at now, and it's um, you know we've got I've just uh, we've introduced an indoor CQB range, so we now Please, have I saw that yeah there, we yeah. now have uh, Sig Sauer, so I got well, I bought UK, weapons right? from Sig yeah. yeah, so I got MCX rifles. I mean they're air rifles, but they're perfectly they're cosmetically and um, and sort of ergonomically perfect to the weapons, and we've got two two six pistols. So the semi-automatic, we go through the whole procedures. Um, you know, we teach people marksmanship. Coach, we coach them into sort of snap and instinctive shooting. We've got some CQB lanes inside. Um, we're pushing it outdoor now. So I've built an IBSR, that old individual battle shooting range like they have in Brecon, darting between bits of cover, crawling into cover, engaging targets. You know, so it's a bit of escapism. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of, you know, you know, veterans, I, uh, you know, I have a team of guys that come in and do guest instructors, a couple of XPF guys, a couple of ex guys from uh, down the road. Um, you know, so it's really good. It, 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 it's awesome, mate. It's um, it's in a good place. Good, mate. Good. Good to hear it. Um, blokes always do well when they go, when they, when they, when they go fly alone and get a bit of uh, entrepreneurial spirit. It's just realizing they've got the got the capability. Do you know what I mean? A lot of people don't. A lot of people don't. I think we are. As I think British soldiers um, are very entrepreneurial. It's just having the confidence and the understanding of Civvy Street to action it. That's the big thing, mate. The biggest, my biggest learning curve over the last two years is business. 
you know, we, we come from a we come from an environment where we're not financially minded. And I tell you, I tell you, when I've suddenly become financially minded is that, you know, you, you go on the range in the military and you've got sandbags, you're throwing them away and you're burning figure 11s and figure 12s and that. And now I want figure 11 and figure 12 targets. If you can't get them off the blocks, you're on eBay and, and the 30 quid. <laughs> and I'm going... God, I used to I, I used to throw this stuff away. <laughs> so it's becoming commercially minded. That's the biggest. That's the learning curve. Applying your skills and your knowledge and everything you do. That's not a problem. We do that. We get that, and we get it massive. We're not scared of hard work, long days, long hours. We don't financially expect to be swimming in money. We don't. Get, that's not us. The biggest problem for us, or for me, was the financial aspect of it managing your own books, managing the, the cash flow and, and, and doing media, becoming a social media guru, networking. They're the difficult things that we, 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 we struggle with sometimes. Yeah. Well, I did. Well, the social media is because you're age, but the networking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> tap, no, tap, 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 um, tap. Where do people go to find out about Explatoon? Um, www.explatoon.com. Mm -hmm. um, we're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Go on the website. Everything's there. We do survival courses. We do family adventures for kids. Uh, we do parent, dads and lads, mums and daughters combinations. The whole family sort of come for 24 hours, learn how to make a fire, water purify, learn how to navigate with the sun and stars, build a shelter, ditch technology, and just sort of reconnect over that in the wild, in the wilderness, in the woods. Um around the campfire and it's just sort of that real connection again mm -hmm. um cool yeah uh also before we turn it off um people operation mayhem and uh expert of steve's two books so operation mayhem if you want to get into the nitty 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 gritty in a more structured way in these two podcasts <laughs> yeah <laughs> go and get operation mayhem um it's there everywhere waterstones online three quid on is it still three quid online on Amazon? Is that bargain on? Oh, I mean, is it, that, is it priced yeah. like that for the Northerners? Um, no, well, yeah, I mean, we, 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 you're giving away up there, mate. <laughs> North of Doncaster, they're free. <laughs> Steve, it's been an absolute pleasure, mate. Pleasure, mate.